So starting out with our early universe events. Um, in order to understand the early universe, you really only have to understand one thing, more or less, and that is how did it change since it began? Okay, yes. Over time, we definitely know that the universe has gotten bigger. We know that space has been expanding for all of time, so it cannot be true. Um, as the universe has gotten larger, it's gotten cooler and less dense. So our answer here would be E. So this basically drives everything that we know about how the universe evolves. Um, we think about two different um, trends in the early universe. First is the trend of density. So that's all the stuff in the universe. That's the mass plus energy uh, in a given volume. And from the early universe to today, the density has fallen because space has expanded. And the same thing has happened to the temperature. So that's our red curve. And the real definition of temperature is the average motion energy of different particles. And as particles get more and more spaced out from one another, the temperature drops. So both the density and the temperature of the early universe uh, drop. And this drives everything that happens, all of the events that happen and the order in which they happen is just specifically caused by these two trends. So um, what we have to do is consider what can happen at high temperatures, basically what physics are allowed at high temperatures versus what particles can exist or physics is allowed at lower temperatures. And so those two questions tell us what happens in the early universe. Um, much of what we know comes from basically just the physical models that we have that we've built an understanding of from studying stuff that's not the early universe. So things in particle physics, our understanding of atoms, um, and then our understanding of the four fundamental forces of nature, those are the things that allow us to model the early universe. So this doesn't just come from, you know, a hat. Okay, so I'm gonna just walk through the different epochs and eras of the universe. Your book doesn't talk about this at all, but I think it's helpful to kind of have this timeline. So we're gonna do it. So if we start from time equals zero at the Big Bang, our temperature is infinite. Um, all of the matter and energy in the entire universe is stuffed into one single point. And there is no physics that can possibly describe what's going on here because there's nothing that we can study anywhere else in the universe that even comes close to emulating these conditions. Um, at this time, all of the four fundamental forces in the universe were unified into a single grand force, or at least we think so. Um, and we don't have any grand unified theories that tie together the all fun four fundamental forces. And therefore our physics simply cannot describe what we call the Planck epoch. So the Planck epoch, here be dragons. Next comes the grand unified theory epoch. So at this point, we do have grand unified theories that um, tie together all of the fundamental forces except gravity. So by the time that the um, universe is 10 to the minus 43 seconds old, uh, you know, barely an instant, and the temperature is just a balmy 10 to the 32 Kelvin, gravity is now frozen out from the other forces. So essentially what that means is that the temperature is low enough that gravity is no longer unified with the other four fundamental forces. Um, without getting too deep into the details, each of those forces will separate from each other at lower and lower temperatures and gravity is the first to go. Um, it's possible that some dark matter particles exist in this time, but we have not detected them yet. So um, I wanna just briefly talk about these four fundamental forces. So there's um, gravity, this we're used to, right? Gravity is a force that holds massive objects um, in orbit around each other. Um, there is electromagnetism, which um, basically holds charged particles together. For example, this is the force that's responsible for the electron motion around the nucleus of an atom. And also for, well, at least partly, no, forget it. The strong force is what's responsible for binding the protons and neutrons in the nucleus together. So even though all the protons are positively charged, and so therefore the electromagnetic force would try to slam them away from each other, the strong force is strong enough that it overcomes that and keeps the nucleus together. And then the weak force is 
um, kind of more difficult to describe, but it's involved in radioactive decay and also in the fusion process. So it's a force that's only, uh, basically its only job is to mediate um, changes from proton to neutron. So if a proton becomes a neutron or vice versa, the weak force is involved. And this happens in the fusion process, like we talked about in 122, and I'll show you an example later. Okay, so these are the four fundamental forces, strong, weak, electromagnetic, and gravity. And now I have to tell you about the standard model of particle physics just a little bit uh, because it's related to these four fundamental forces. So the idea in the standard model, I'm just gonna try to simplify this as much as I can, is you've got some things called fermions. These are quarks and leptons. So two different kinds of fermions. Both of these um, are matter particles. So these include some things that we're familiar with like the electron and neutrinos. You might remember neutrinos from 122 if you took it. Um, the muon and the tau are basically heavier versions of the electron and the muon and tau neutrino are heavier versions of the electron neutrino. And then you've got your quarks and these are particles that stick together to make protons and neutrons. So this is all the matter that goes into making atoms. And then next to the fermions, we've got our bosons, which are the force carriers. So there's a different force carrier for every um, force. So those are, let me get rid of that. Uh, the strong force, which its force carrier particle is called the gluon. So therefore the strong force that holds together the nucleus needs the gluon as a particle to interact with these quarks that it glues together. Um, the W and Z boson, those are all the force carriers of the weak force. There's two kinds of W boson, but just one Z. And then the photon is the carrier of the electromagnetic force. So strong, weak, and electromagnetic, they all have their own bosons. Um, there's a hypothetical boson called the graviton that should mediate gravity, um, but the particle physicists do not include this in the standard model because there's no evidence for it at the present time. All right, so this is our standard model. And the reason I'm telling you about this weird connection between particles and um, forces is because as the temperature of the early universe drops, the heavy particles freeze out before the light particles freeze out. And that also means that the um, forces that those particles mediate freeze out in order of the um, mass of their bosons. So um, potentially, if dark matter particles existed during the gut epoch, they would have to be more massive than the gluon. So maybe this helps someone who's on a dark matter journey of discovery. Um, food for thought. Okay. This is a lot, but what questions do you have about this idea of the force carriers, the forces, and what's going on here in the gut epic? All right, moving on to our quark epic. So now the time has barely changed. It's now 10 to the minus 35 seconds, temperature 10 to the 27 Kelvin. This is when the strong force freezes out. So gravity already dropped out. Now the strong force is dropping out. And also later within the quark epoch, the weak force and the electromagnetic force, which are previously unified, finally separate. So sometime later, I mean, quite a while later on our time scale here, and at a much lower temperature. So the four fundamental forces start to part ways in the gut epoch with gravity, and then the quark epoch, all the other forces uh, separate from each other in turn. So that means that their bosons have frozen out and now there are particles um, hanging out in the early universe. Okay, when the strong force freezes out, it produces gluons. And the way I like to think of gluons are like their glue. These are the gluons, these little springs that hold together the quarks, which are these red, green, and blue particles. 
And this is what we, um, this is how we think of protons and neutrons as little bags of quarks held together by gluons. So when the strong force freezes out, this is important because it means that now the raw materials to form protons and neutrons exist. So during the quark epoch, we've got all of our quarks and we're starting to develop gluons. And then later we also develop the W boson, which is helpful because it is, uh, will allow for nuclear fusion. So we need all these particles around. Okay, I see the question in the chat. Yeah, so when I say that a force freezes out, it means that it acts in a way that can be physically described in a separate theory rather than being unified into a single theory. So like if I describe um, electricity and magnetism, for example, I use one set of equations. And if I want to describe the physics related to the weak force, I, I use a different set of equations. And before that, they would be unified into a single description. I think that's my best way to, to discuss that. Okay. And then, um, yeah, so because particles freeze out in the order of their mass, then jumping, I guess, back for a second here, we know that the photon is, uh, well, it's a massless particle. Um, so the Z and W bosons are the, are the last particles to freeze out amongst our force carriers. The gluon is heavier than that, so it froze out earlier. And then whatever dark matter particles might exist would have to be even heavier than gluons. So don't ask me about all the um, gnarly details of why dark matter particles are theorized to be heavier, um, but this is an expectation is that there would have been potentially some dark matter particles at that time. Okay. So at the very um, start of the quark epoch, this is when inflation begins. Uh, we'll talk about inflation later because I want to finish telling you the full timeline of universe history. So keep this in mind, inflation happens at the start of the quark epoch and everything after is after inflation. Okay. So after the quark epoch, we have our lepton epoch. Remember the quarks were the, um, the well, the quarks, they're matter particles that form nuclei and the leptons are our electrons and our neutrinos. And so during the lepton epoch, those light particles, electrons are pretty light, neutrinos are really light particles, um, those freeze out now because finally the temperature is low enough that they can exist. Um, so basically our early universe at this time now contains protons and neutrons. Remember they're allowed to form now that we have gluons, neutrinos, and then radiation. We've been awash in radiation this whole time. All right. So the lepton epoch, now we're starting to get into like a human time scale, 0.1 seconds. This is something that you could measure on a stopwatch if your fingers are fast enough, I guess. Um, and so everything before this time like has happened within a tenth of a second. So all the forces, they, they bloop, fall out really fast. Inflation happens, um, all the stuff is made, and now finally leptons are made. And this is really, now we have all the raw materials and we can get cooking making other stuff in the early universe. Okay, so a little bit deeper into the lepton epoch and what you can kind of like, what sort of mental model you might wanna have for what's going on here. We've got our protons. I'm gonna say that those are a plus one particle. Those are the blue guys here. And then our neutrons are these red guys. And then our neutrinos are these pink and radiation is going to be a red squiggle. So basically we have a hot and dense soup of material in the lepton epoch. All right, so um, dark matter particles such as weakly interacting massive particles are also likely to you know, continue existing during this epoch. 
Um, if there are lighter dark matter particles, those could come into being during this time as well. Okay, but as far as detailed, you know, dark matter descriptions, different WIMP models and how they fit into the standard model, those questions are frankly beyond my pay grade. Um, but I do have people who know the answers to these, well, do research on the answers to these questions. So I can point you their way if you have really detailed questions. Okay, so we've got our dark matter particles and if they exist, they're just smushed in with the rest of the stuff. So we've just got a soup of stuff. Everything's pretty dense at this point. It's all packed together. Um, there's something really fun going on at this point because it's so dense and the temperature is so high then we have this process called pair production where you have two photons that can come together and as they um, meet when there's enough energy in one place you can have a particle and an antiparticle be created and so this pair production process creates a pair of particles hence the name one of them would be a matter particle such as an electron and the other one would be an antimatter particle an antimatter particle is the same has all the same properties as its matter particle, except the opposite electric charge. So that's the difference in a nutshell. So you're creating electrons and positrons at this time, for example. Um, but the thing about matter and antimatter is that if they cross paths, then they annihilate with each other and create radiation. And so both of these processes are balanced during the lepton epoch for the most part. But as we know, there's not a whole lot of antimatter out in the universe today. There's not like, you know, we don't see antimatter annihilating all the things around us, which is good. Um, and we really have no idea why that is the case. So there must have been some slight imbalance in the generation of matter over antimatter in the early universe. We don't know why this happened. It's called the antimatter problem because we don't understand it but it's good that it happened because it means that there's a little bit leftover matter to create all this stuff in the universe. So that's all going down in the lepton epoch. Okay, once we move into the nuclear epoch, so 300 seconds after the Big Bang, the temperature is now low enough that we can start to uh, produce um, nuclei so instead of just having protons and neutrons hanging around, we form things like deuterium, which is one proton plus one neutron, or we can form things like helium, where we have two protons, two neutrons. And these, these processes to make deuterium and helium from fusion are the same processes that go on inside of stars today. So stars take hydrogen, which is just protons, and they fuse them into deuterium and helium through these processes, which we covered in 122. They're a lot more complicated than we're discussing here. Um, but there's actually too much universe, uh, too much helium in the universe if it only uh, was produced within stars. So this is one of the ways that we know how much fusion was happening in the early universe. And this is um, good evidence that what we call primary nucleosynthesis, um, so like Big Bang nucleosynthesis, nuclei being synthesized in the Big Bang process actually happened because we can measure that the abundance of helium is too much to have only been made by stars. All right, so this is one of the pieces of evidence for the Big Bang model. Okay, also during the nuclear epoch, we can form things up to lithium. So lithium is um, kind of like helium, but it has one extra proton. So if you add a proton, you go up in atomic number and you form a new element. Um, but it's, um, so this is basically the heaviest we can get to um, because anything heavier than this, it, it's too hot, it gets broken apart. So this is the end of the chain for our primary nucleosynthesis in the nuclear epoch. So these are the only elements that we have formed during the Big Bang, hydrogen, some of the helium and lithium. And all this other stuff is formed either in stellar nucleosynthesis, which means fusion within stars, or in the process of 
um, supernova explosions. There's heavier nuclei that are synthesized that way. There are some things that are only um, formed by cosmic rays driving um, fission. And then there are some elements that are actually only man-made that we've only generated in the lab and they don't exist anywhere in nature. Okay, so we're only making nuclei at this point. We don't really have atoms yet because atoms are what happens when you have an electron um, and a nucleus together or some number of electrons and nucleus together. Um, but here we just have bare nuclei. They have not paired up with their electrons to become atoms. And the reason for that is because it's still too hot for atoms to form. Any atoms that form are broken apart by the, um, by the dense radiation environment. So here's a little cartoon for why that is the case. If we have an atom, um, some photon will come along and drive the electron off of that atom. So because the universe is still very dense, there's a lot of radiation, it's very likely to interact with any atoms that form, and so it breaks them apart. So it's not until after the nuclear epoch that we can form atoms. And fittingly, the next epoch is called the atomic epoch. And all that's happened is that it's finally become cool enough for electrons to combine with nuclei and form atoms. We call this process recombination, even though maybe you just want to call it combination because they haven't existed before, but whatever, this is what it's called. Uh, the temperature at this point is 3,000 3, Kelvin, and the um, time is 380,000 years. So if there's one time in this whole time sequence that you would like to remember, this is the one. This is a critical time in our early universe. The first atoms are born. This is when the cosmic microwave background is released. So why is that? Well, if we've got our electrons that are zipping past our atomic nuclei, and maybe this nucleus happens to capture one of the electrons and form an atom. Before this time, it was too, too dense. It was too, um, too often radiation would be knocking these electrons back off of the atoms. Um, but now it's no longer, there's, it's too spread out. So the temperature is lower, the density has dropped. And so it's less likely for any given photon to come and destroy this newly made atom. So this is the recombination process. And um, now that the density is low enough, it means that not only can atoms form, but also the light that does exist can just whiz right past the atoms without bothering them at all. Um, and so it can freely um, radiate away from the early universe. And this is called photon decoupling. So these are the very technical terms, um, recombination being the process, photon decoupling being sort of the event that creates the cosmic microwave background. So recombination means electrons join up with nuclei to form atoms. Photon decoupling means that the density is low enough that light can travel freely past the atoms instead of being absorbed. So the photons are decoupled from their um, interactions with atoms. It doesn't mean that it will never happen. It's just much less likely than it used to be. Okay, so this is the point at which the cosmic microwave background is released. So I guess these little photons are the photons of our CMB. Okay, so that's 380,000 years after the Big Bang. What other questions do you have about the atomic epoch? Do we know how much the universe had expanded at this point? Yes, I think you can find that. So this is after the inflationary period. So I don't know what the radius is like, but it's at least 10 to the 25 meters, but probably much larger. But yes, that exists somewhere. You can find the graphs that show you the radius of the universe with time and they show the, the temperature and the density crossings and all the different epochs. So that graph exists somewhere. 
Okay. Um, we're almost done with our early universe tour. Um, we're not so early now. So we've entered the galactic epic. Um, this is about 200 million years after the Big Bang. The temperature is now quite cool, only 60 Kelvin. Um, the universe has expanded quite a lot by this point. So the density has dropped down. The temperature has dropped. And at this point, most of the galaxies and large scale structures, you know, those filaments and voids, those are fully formed. And after this point, we reach the stellar epoch. This is where we are today. So it starts at 3 billion years and it goes on to now around 13.8 billion years. Um, and stars are essentially continuing to form. Um, so we say that stars are basically dominant during this um, era. And this is when dark energy also starts to play a bigger role in our universe's fate. So we'll come back to that at the end of class. But answer the question. So when did dark matter start growing galaxies? The atomic epoch is when we start to grow galaxies. Okay, not as obvious as it seems. Let me step back and talk about this. So we've got our dark matter particles here. Um, I think it would be helpful if you remember the map of the Big Bang, this oval with blue and green dots on it. So we already saw in the cosmic microwave background that there are little pockets of density fluctuations. So those density fluctuations had to already have started forming um, during the atomic epoch. So meaning, remember we said that the cool spots were spots where um, matter was starting to clump and the hot spots in the CMB that tend to be colored orange or red, those are the voids between these spots, right? And so the idea is that the characteristic size scale of these um, cool spots, those set the characteristics, um, I, those basically tell us the density of our universe. So in order to find the density of the universe, it's going to be the density of the atomic epoch or even before, um, but we know for sure that at least the clumping that had to happen must have started before the galactic epoch. We've got all these different epochs. I don't think I've labeled them all. So a fun thing for you to do could be to make a copy of this slide and then label all these epochs and maybe draw a little cartoon for what was going on in the early universe at each one. <laughs> 